That is so funny. No, 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 you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. Are you tripping for a second? Yeah. Thank you for calling. Can I help you? Hey, how you doing there, sir? I was calling about some information. Yeah. We need new talent to be covered. You gotta stay the disruptor. Internet never sleeps. It's taken the power away from the media. It's impossible to predict what's going to be happening six months from now. If they put a video up on YouTube, that video could go to a million views and everyone's coming to their table. So I remember when there was just three channels, you know what I mean? And it was like, and then I remember when TV turned off, you know, they want to control it, but you can't, you can't. I mean, you have to give the people what they want. The big companies could never compete with an individual because me, the viewer, I don't trust them, but I trust her, I trust them. It has allowed every independent creator out there to be entrepreneurs. We live, baby. Yo guys, I'm Ryan Taylor and at the age of 13 I stole a BMX bike and it changed my life forever. A couple of years ago I did a video of Jamal Edwards from SBTV and it got me thinking about some of the stuff that I'm doing on my YouTube channel and I basically want to just go link up with Jamal, check in with him and talk about how YouTube has changed our lives since we last connected. Oh, in a yes. When SBTV first came out, fam, I was in school. SBTV has paved the way for all music on YouTube 100%. I mean, the industry would be a different place if SBTV and platforms like that didn't exist. I think it was when he got his first check um, from Google. He, he's like, Mommy, look, I've got a check, I've got a check. And I'm more like, yes, but that's not going to actually pay the bills right now, so you make sure you do your studies and everything else. And he still rips me about it to this day. The red and white. Women is get up. Get the chop off. Pull up. I'm picking up man like SP. Keeping my face on the screen. So what? What are you gonna film today, bro? Uh, today I'm doing some warm up. We're not even warm ups. Doing live tracks. Look, big smile when I slap guys. I'm a madman. Wet man getting baptized. I don't tell lies. I'm a threat to the Joe guys. My sweat beat face. Dog never fair. No Joe time. Which is like a, a series, a new series that I that I've been doing. Oh, I got my car. I'm driving, bro. If you want to take it, we we'll go roll together if you want. Oh, They're called to catch it on my bro and you for a minute, man. 100%, man. This is this, yeah. Do you guys do this? You're about to see how it goes on behind the scenes. Mm. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, yeah. I'm just shot you back when I'm first filming, innit? Like, yeah, that's it. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All I took is money. I don't really care about views. More than enough come for the what's it. And it come bigger than what's it. Still put the fours on the table and chop it. When I rise on the AM, I just count this profit. Bro, tell me a little bit about the history of Grime. Like, obviously, it's a lot older than what I know it is. From my early personal experience with Grime, it was on like Channel U, Channel AKA, sort of um, watching those programs. But then also the DVD era. So, DVD, like, Lord of the Mics, Whiskey Road, Practice Hours. We used to listen to that like, pirate radio, so like Layla FM, um, Rinse FM. And then obviously that was just bubbling. People used to go to raves and that, but then rave started getting locked off because of like Form 696, which has been abolished now. But back in the day, that was just like a terrible thing for the scene and for the scene to be able to grow. So it was just a lot of banging down the doors. like, And that's why I sort of created SBT because I wanted to create another platform to put these artists on, which is outside of the mainstream Mainstream media. Yo, man got styley, man I got swag. Come from the road, dear man got a track. Get away from the Jays car, man I got flats. Man get burst car, man I got straps. Man got styley, man I got mine. Man can't see me, man got a grind. Man got flows and a man's got rhymes. Dead man hate them, man I got time. It's like, yeah, the bird's got to fly away from its nest one day. Do you know what I'm saying? So you go to SBTV will be there to support you until your fan base is strong enough or whatever. Then when you, or once you feel comfortable yourself, 
to progress onto the next stage and go and do it on your own channel the next time. So yo, if all these artists are using your platform as let's let's say a stepping stone, yeah. What's up for the future of what does that mean for the future of your platform? I feel like like yeah, I am a stepping stone. I wanna help artists, help them build them up, but then everyone needs to be their own boss. Do you know what I'm saying? So I feel like I wanna help alongside other people to help build their channels and then they become their own bosses. You have to use the buzz and the, the viralness to your your advantage. That's a, that's something that a lot of people might there's a blurred line because you might think, oh you've got this hot song, like you're popping now and that's it. No, you have to keep going. You need to get back in the studio, you need to keep putting out content. The freestyles and stuff is just an amazing um, addition to what you're doing. You got too much lip, Jay-Z. <laughs> this album I bought. Some girl at way too vain when I look clap like a round of applause. Left him in a state, but he don't count as abroad. <laughs> SBT with the entrepreneur. Ugh. I'm, I'm like 10 years deep in. The grime scene's like 10, 15, 20 years deep in. Like now it's just getting up there and it's only the beginning. When I was in school, I, was like, I remember being in year eight and Dizzy had brought out his second album and everyone was playing that. And Wiley had brought out Playtime's Over, the t-shirts were everywhere, Tinchy Strider had his star in the hood. Like it was a really popping time for grime music. And that's when I got into it. And I actually did my first grime collaboration when I was 15 with Slicks from Rough Squad. Well, I was like in touch with them at MySpace and he sent me loads of beats and I've just put vocals on them. Then he took it and then they went on Slicks' mixtapes. So that was like my first ever collaboration at 15 with someone in Rough Squad. Yeah, you can find them online. They're it's quite cool to like go back and and listen to, but but yeah, I uh, but I've always loved grime, and then like by doing the first SB video that I did, I just kept getting hit hit up by people, all these people that I loved, you know, people like JME, who was like come to the studio, and I had the boy better know mixtapes, and I had a boy better know T-shirt, and then I was in the studio making a tune with him for my EP. It was pretty pretty cool. I used to have conversations with Ed about Sway, and about Smiler, and about like a verse from Rich's retrospective album. Do you know what I mean? And like, a lot of people never get to experience that side of Ed. Like, he loves his music. I don't glamorize it, I analyze it, to analyze this. My man is madness, many men are my man, I'm madder than the man hat. It's a game of sex and that there's nothing without us. <laughs> like, you know, he did four EPs before the collaborations one, and there's no surprise that like, the collaborations EP was the, the EP that sped his journey up because he knew that JME's incredible, P Money's incredible, Wretch is incredible, Sway's incredible. I need to be collaborating with what is the most exciting scene in UK music. No one believed it was then, but he did. I like reminding people of that story because it kind of, it shows that there is no Ed without UK MC culture. Weren't around when I was fouled down and out. You ain't eating man's dinner. Driving in a foreign, getting top from Lauren. You would have thought this was Beanie Man's Bimmer. Zim, zim up. Trust me, cause I woke up this morning feeling like a winner. Now I've enjoyed today, man. It was cool. No, man, definitely, man. It's been, it's been, I'm tired, but it's been good to sort of get in the essence of like filming and doing it again. I've been getting distracted by so much other stuff and it's like, yeah, this is what I enjoy doing. What I've got to do is take 10 steps and another 10 steps to the next check. Got stuck up in the mix like Semtex. I won't see no DJ around and I'm seeing his phones and I've got to send a next text. Make a next phone call for a next text. Them men never allowed, but I move more quiet because I've never been into the death rush. I'm about to go to jail for him. Because I've done too much illegal shit on YouTube. <laughs> do it. Like, if, if, you, if you stand by it, do it. But you've got to realise, if you get in trouble now and you're getting taken to court, maybe you need to think how you're going to attack it differently. Bro. I feel like but it's going to get the best reaction when you are yourself, though, when you're doing exactly what you want to do. What, being an asbo? Nah, not even that, because it's not like I'm trying to be like, I think it's just fun. Excuse me, you went to the swimming pool and then they, they put the alarm on and then you went back and ran through and they just trying to stop you. If they didn't try to stop you, then I understand. Yeah, but I, I, I did that because I wanted to go off. <laughs> I wanted to do the diving board. You always do that, why? Because it's cool. You just do shit for views, yeah, fam. it's cool. Uh, do you know what, do you know what, but the real talk, you're doing that for views, I'm filming MCs and artists with views. So exposure, it's, it's you know all know exposure. Saying? But the difference is, I'm not running in here having them lot stopping me trying to film. Are we done filming? Is that you? Are we done filming? Is that you been yes or no? Now. Yes or no, is that you? Yeah, a little bit. See? <laughs> Rebel with a cause. That's not a whip. That's a car. You ain't nobody. Shaka Khan. Skepta got one million hits on a YouTube freestyle. That's a part. Has the YouTube culture gone too far? Like, people just doing crazy stuff for views. 
Everyone's doing stuff for views, that's, that's, that's all TV is, it's the same thing, but obviously YouTube is taking over now. So there's daily content creators, and then there's savage content creators like myself that do ridiculous shit. But obviously TV's filtered, YouTube isn't as filtered, but all that needs to get done now is obviously creators need to take more responsibility for the content. I grew up watching Blue Peter, kids now watch YouTubers. I'm starting to do a lot more things when it comes to like acting and sit out in LA for like two months and worked on this movie and me and Castle had the best of times. Three years ago I'd been doing YouTube for three or four years and I thought oh I need to try and get to another level and I thought maybe I should do feature films. It can be quite hard because obviously as a YouTuber I love creative control. I've done a few movies which was really really fun. Uh, the guys higher up decided to release it straight onto DVD like instantly and they forgot our type of audience is like online savvy so they're gonna just take the DVD and <laughs> pirate it. While doing all of that stuff that I really did enjoy I realized that why am I trying to move to another stage? I think the next stage is actually YouTube. And people to say it's gonna the, the bubble's gonna burst, it's done, it's like it ain't gonna burst, you know, online is the future, like digital, you got Netflix, Amazon Prime, YouTube Red. TV is on the decline, YouTube and social media is just constantly on the up. I guess because mine was the niche of chicken shops, it was something different and it was different enough to garner a bigger audience than other um, channels that might just review food in general. It's a bit wild. What am I meant to say? Like it, you know, everyone in North London always hails chicken, but I went there and there was a bowl in my burger, like. That's the thing about YouTube and if you've got your own YouTube channel, is that you are in control of your content, which is something that you don't have if you're with a broadcaster or anyone else. So that is what I don't take for granted at all, but it's, it's the main reason why I'm on YouTube. Like, I get to decide everything about the videos I'm making. And as a young person who's just started out, that's like, when do you get that? I want to turn this into a ball pit. All right, this used to be the office uh, for our clothing line but uh, the clothing line got a bit too big. I think that's the thing with YouTubers, a lot of them need to uh, get given really solid financial advice. A few of the neighbours started complaining when we had trucks and trucks and trucks constantly coming through. There'll always be YouTubers, but you'll come up and down, and if you're doing really well that year, don't just think that that's gonna continue and you can spend that money like it's a salary. So they were just like, this, this place is in a warehouse. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So we, just, we were like, yeah, fair enough, this place isn't a warehouse, we'll, uh, we'll actually get a warehouse. And then you have to think about what can they do afterwards? Can they start commentating on it? Can they start working in the industry? Can they build a business outside of it? I think Jamal Edwards has done a really good job at that. Yo, when you've been in the game for 10 years and you've got yourself such a well-respected name in the industry, how do you top that? How do you better yourself? I think one of the main things is like going global. So like going to North America, Europe, um, and obviously the scene now is global anyway, and I just want to play my little part to take it even further. Wait, is it that one? I think so. Whoa. That's cool. Is this a part where I pick rooms? Yeah, safe oh, room. Nah, 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 nah. I'm, I'm too tired, man. What's the place? Whoa. <laughs> Bacon soda, I like got bacon, bacon soda. soda. Lada leg stuff. Yo, I've got a meeting to go to, but I'll give you a shot later if you can pick me up. What are you going to a meeting now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just some business stuff. No, I'll just holler later then. Yeah, I'll holler later then. Hey, what are you saying? What's up, boy? You get tall every time I see you. Oh, God, my G. What's happening? You're good, yeah? Come on. Good to see you, man. See you. What are you saying? What you been up to, man? I need to come out here more often. Ten years now. Move out here. My, my audience, the second most biggest, is in the States. Word? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But they don't see me enough to connect with me to follow it through, so that's what I'm gonna do. What you was doing with Stampede? So Russ, I know Russell from like ages ago. Yeah, I thought you were just coming to hang. I was like, oh, you bringing cameras and shit. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's what we doing today. Moving out here next week still. Next week? Yeah, yeah, no. Nah, lying like a motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> nah, soon though. Always come for like a week. And then as soon as it starts getting like, everyone starts here in town, I leave. Get some shit cracking, man. Yeah, please. The next five to 10 years is hopefully scaling it up and taking it here, or even taking it over Far East, I think it would be sick as well. When things were going from more hand-to-hand -hand marketing, 
word of mouth to digital, we started seeing the change in the guard in the business and started seeing that artists were controlling their own distribution, controlling their own content, and controlling their own conversation with their fans. And then not only that, like, you know, it's good standing pin. I don't owe nobody no money. All the money I make is all mine. You know, no cuts, nowhere. It's all mine, 100%. And you know, I learned how to tour myself, market myself. But what if you're a guy who has connections to thousands of people? You're a mini conglomerate. You're just not pimping niggas for money like that. You're just trying to get something out there. They don't have to go through what I went through. They don't have to go and make the record, wait for the CD to burn, put, package it up, then go and wait outside of a building for someone to go like this, thank you, and then throw it in the trash. That doesn't have to happen anymore. Urban music got put in a box really because of the formats of radio, and we weren't really selling as much. The internet broke the stranglehold that radio had on this, and it exposed it to a whole new group of people. And it, streaming just really kind of allowed us to monetize what we knew was happening on an underground level anyway. I don't really care, man, I come, I bounce right back, bounce back. Man, I come around, man, I ounce that, bounce track. I'm chatting shit on a mic. You don't wanna come around, got 97's night, got night air, air. You don't wanna come around, hair. Don't just stare, Ventura. I'm a Ventura, you know that it's ace. With the whole rise of the internet, there's something very important that's been lost. And I think that's the, um, the, the actual making of music. You hope that they say, hey, I want you to come to the studio. We, you know, we working on so-and-so's vocals to tomorrow. Can you come? You hope for that. Where now, a producer will just send an artist a beat and they'll just jump on it. You know, I'm pretty sure Michael Jackson was recording with Quincy Jones. You know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just pretty sure that, you know, David Foster was there with Whitney Houston when he said, I will always love you. Nowadays, it's just a little different now. And I feel that that essence has been lost. I prefer myself to be there. I don't think it's fair on the artist. Let's just send them anything. Two heads is better than one. A lot of times I might come up with a melody or a harmonies or something right there in the making of it. You know what I mean? So that's why I prefer to be around it. You can hear it. You're old school in the new school world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a yeah. Yeah, I feel, yeah, definitely old school in the new school world, but definitely. But all the coming, you have to change, maintain, and keep with the times. I would argue no one ever sold content, that there was always content, unlimited content available for free. In other words, if you wanted music, you could find someone playing music on, you know, busking on the corner or what have you, right? Uh, but if you wanted to listen to what you wanted, by whom you wanted, when you wanted, where you were, that was something you had to pay for. Started off with the A track, evolved to vinyl, into cassettes, to CDs, and now it's digital. Obviously, brother, the game has changed a little bit. Physical product is now, what, less than 30% of the entire market. It used to be almost 90%. Everyone who, who wants to be in the music business or have to, or, or be artists or share their music or have it build audiences has to understand how to manipulate those mediums to their benefit. You know, Eminem raps in a parking lot in Detroit against Trump, and boom, the whole world hears about it and writes about it. So I think the internet changed everything. For example, the music industry, I think, mistakenly believed that they were selling music, when in fact what they were selling was convenience and quality and access. And so what we're seeing now is marketers using content to aggregate audiences that they can sell things to. But it's not the content that they're selling. Does that make sense? But what I think is people like Apple and people like Spotify are going to end up opening their own record labels and signing their own artists. I think that's kind of what's going to happen. Like, I wouldn't be surprised. Because they know the numbers they're getting and everything, they're going to just start signing artists and putting them as priority through their sites and in all their playlists and everything. And you're going to subconsciously just hear their music and it's going to automatically create fan base. You know what I'm saying? You could be the greatest musician in the world. People base things off numbers now. Everything's a numbers game. That's it. It's true. Isn't it? It doesn't matter what you've done. No. <laughs> before it was about what you've done before, yeah, innit? Yeah. Respect, the history. Yeah, no one cares about no one respect, cares. the history. The songs are good. You better be doing it now. <laughs> yeah. You're not doing it now. If you're not relevant now, see you later. See you later. <laughs> We've been at it, obviously, and you've been uploading that like, videos every day. 
your souls, you're not even if you don't have Wi-Fi and that, you're still saying, I need to upload the video at nine o'clock. What like what makes you so like relentless like that? I know I know my people are waiting. So the hat you got on, bro, the certain fam. I know, I know, I know, the, I know they're waiting. <laughs> 8 p.m. every day, bro, they're ready. And if I don't upload one, my Twitter goes nuts. And they're just like, yo, where's the video? Where's the video? You try and blame it on me. They gotta be consistent in it. It's like a TV show. Anyone goes back for a TV show every day. Try and give that consistency to them. They know when to go back in it. They're gonna subscribe, turn on the notifications, whatever they need to do, and they're gonna go back all the time. It's back in the day, bro, I started. Bro, I was there in my videos for like six years, bro, before I built a team. Go on, talk about it, bro. You, I know you feel the pain to tell me about it. No, but, no, no, <laughs> but I said, I think, like, obviously, now I've got a team, and obviously, you say you wanna build out, build out yourself and delegate to other people. But when I first started for like five, six years, it was a lot. I was at you. I was like, video a day minimum. Do you know what I'm saying? If you get two or three, then that's good. But it was different because of music, you just got loads of, you got so much talent. And my days weren't as exciting as yours back in the early days. Yeah, it might, it might have been, I might have been filming different artists, but to start off, it was just like, for six years, it was just me. I was doing music videos, interviews, promos. I was just doing everything. And then after that, that's where it got to a point where it was at boiling point. I need to, like delegate and I think you even said to me the other day like you want to start delegating and building your team it's about taking it to the next level after that yo I want to just check in with my certified fam real quick big shout out to my brother Jamal Edwards and I also want to just say look at this rooftop up here I want to run my bike on there as well but we'll just wait for that guys we'll wait for that today we're running around we're meeting Joe Santagato Casey Neistat nice we're meeting bad people to film what I can because this is just bad right now which I bet you guys have said I, I swear to God, honestly, I don't think it's that hard. I really don't. And like, it's, you film it, but like some people don't even film it anymore. They have people film it, people edit it. They just gotta live their life. And then they, you know, they make a bunch of money off of that. So sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's hard. It depends what you're doing. It depends on the person, honestly. I can see how it can be very easy and I can see how it can be very hard. There were people who would make one video a week, but they would make a video that was like, check out these 25 items in my room. I'm yeah. like, what the? Fuck effort went into that. I'm killing myself saying this. So when I get back, I am gonna get a film editor because like, I can't even have a relationship. I've got one, I'm, I'm, I'm engaged, but shit, has no time, bro. Like, so we go on holidays, I'm like, oh, I gotta finish this edit. Look at this one now. Like, it's fucked, bro. So what are you saying, bro? Have you built your team yet? Trying, bro. Since we got back from that trip, I've already had three different guys involved, man. And yeah, the thing that lasted no more than 48 hours, bro, it was done. Well, at least you're trying. Welcome to the world of employment, my G. Yeah, it took you 10 years, in it, G? So, I've got time, <laughs> no, Don't try to put it down time. like that, B. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't try to put it down like that, B. You've got, you got, you got nine years to go, B. <laughs> you know, I think one of the biggest lies ever told about YouTube is that every video is sort of made in your bedroom. Now, the kinds of productions that are, are being put on YouTube are close to what you would see on TV or anywhere else. The difference is they're typically made by a very small amount of people. So it is a tremendous amount of work. Hey, dipshit, can you turn off your fucking motorcycle? We're trying to record here. <laughs> it's a truly democratic um, kind of meritocracy on, on YouTube, in that if you make something that there's an, an appetite for, there's an audience for, it will succeed. What's interesting about the growth of my own channel on YouTube was that I was on YouTube for four years. I uh, accrued about 400, 420,000 subscribers. And then I switched the format of my YouTube channel from what I saw as just a distribution medium for my short films to something that was much more conversational, which is a daily show, where I interacted a lot more with my audience. It was a lot more about me instead of just the creation. And in the next 18 months thereafter, it went from 400,000 subscribers to 5 million subscribers. And that growth has continued. And I attribute a lot of that to the fact that when people click subscribe, they're not necessarily subscribing to the content as much as they are the person behind that content. Oh! <laughs> That's been a really interesting paradigm shift. The viewers of the content have absolute agency over what content they see, how they see it, and where they see it. And I think that's indicative of, of why brands and companies never succeed. It's indicative of why MTV um, could never succeed on YouTube. It's because I don't know where that's coming from. I don't know your motives. Do you actually give a shit about the content you're putting in front of me or is this just to sell ads? What is this? And it's that skepticism that I think has, we've all always harbored against the content we see that we now have agency over. Because on YouTube, if we don't trust it, you don't watch it. With TV and uh, with radio, it's all very controlled. Like, you can't get anything organic. And I feel like 
that's so important. That's why YouTube did well in the first place. I, d I don't want it to go down the route where everything is controlled and it just turns into TV. I don't want YouTube to turn into TV because I don't watch TV anymore. I think they're going to become a lot more careful about their advertisers and where they put their money, which makes it difficult for creators to keep that freedom of speech. Uh, but it is also important for advertisers to know that they're, you know, supporting content that they believe in too. So I see that. Um, I also see people are going to create bigger teams around them and channels are just going to start to get a billion views a month and it's going to be absolutely incredible to see the kind of level of content you'll be able to produce um, just without a paywall and for free through just mass viewership. I mean, I think there's always skepticism and there will always be skepticism when you're seeing something that has commercial purposes behind it. Um, YouTube is a for-profit company. Uh, most of the videos you're seeing on YouTube are monetized. A lot of the content you're seeing on YouTube is also supported by brands. So I think there's always tremendous amount of skepticism, which is why am I watching this and can I believe this? And I think one thing that can penetrate that kind of skepticism is if you have a personal relationship with the, the author of that content, of the person behind it. So with that, when the, the person behind that is a company like Viacom, like an MTV, or like a, like a, a Taco Bell or a food company, I'm much less willing to trust that entity than I am to trust Tyler Oakley. I think what we've seen in the last decade with social media is sort of a wild enthusiasm and excitement for its capability. That was sort of the first public global reaction to this new communication opportunity that was social media. And we're now just turning, we're just making the first turn, which is understanding the, the negative implications of having this network that is social media. And I think if you look at the election um, here in the United States and you see how easy it is to manipulate uh, a force like Facebook to put misinformation in front of people using the very same algorithms that are there to meant to distribute uh, and promote the kinds of information that individuals are interested in. Um, we're starting to see the dangers of social media. Um, even on YouTube, you know, YouTube, which I still see as this unbelievably optimistic and opportunistic platform to distribute information the way it's never been distributed before, it has a dark underbelly that YouTube's fighting to, to protect itself from, but it's still very present on the platform. So when I look to the future, I see having a, a real confrontation between people who, who see these platforms not as an opportunity to promote good and positivity via their communicative powers, but really undermine um, sort of public understanding because of these um, communicative powers. And I think confronting that is what we're gonna see in the next couple of years, and I'm, I'm both nervous about it um, and, and optimistic that there, there are solutions to the problems we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm.